talking a little bit about what we're doing at our particular institutions, and then we'll leave it open for some extra time uh, for discussion. Specifically, wanted to lay out the format. Um, while we're talking, if you have any like really burning, clarifying questions, like what did you mean by X, you know, feel free to jump in then, but otherwise leave your um, deeper questions to the end. And immediately following our third um, presentation, what we actually want you to do is to turn and talk with a neighbor about the findings that we had and what might have been interesting to you or where you may have had similar or divergent findings. So kind of keep that in mind as we're talking that you'll want to turn to a neighbor a little bit. Then we'll have the kind of the typical large group conversations, but then we also want to reserve the last five minutes to synthesize a bit about what it is that you want to take home to your institution and apply tomorrow or Monday. So also keep that in mind. So with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jason Mock, and I'm the lead instructional designer for Coursera projects at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we have about eight MOOCs live right now and another 12 or so in development, of which I'm involved with most of them. And the question that I kind of have is, you know, what really counts as a participant? What does it take to count someone as a participant? And another question might be, what does success even mean in a MOOC? And I mean that on multiple levels. Like, what does it mean for a student to be successful in a MOOC? What does it mean for the institution to be successful in delivering MOOCs in general or an individual faculty member? The rest of these questions, these are the kind of questions that kind of keep me up at night. And what I want to try to do today is lay out a stage of just kind of like questioning how we answer these questions and the ways in which we answer these questions differently have institutional benefits. We all have our own unique stories to tell, but it also makes it a little bit more difficult for all of us to talk to one another as researchers and practitioners in the field. So I may only ask questions and not give answers if that's okay. Um, so one of the traditional metrics that, oh, this formatting got strange, but that's fine. Um, traditional metrics that we use when we're talking about MOOCs is course completion, right? It's kind of the first easiest, lowest hanging fruit metric to judge a course by. And it's also the, court, the metric that we're used to judging courses by in our traditional higher ed courses. So you'll often hear people point to course completion as the metric of choice, or at least the first metric that they look at in a MOOC. And I want to kind of talk about a few pros, but mostly some cons of that particular approach. Um, this is how you might see it characterized. 4% of students pass the class. It's a very generalized, typical number. I know the numbers vary based on who you ask, but I want to decompact this just a little bit. Um, namely, looking first to that 4%. That is a very low number by traditional standards. That's one of the criticisms that MOOCs have um, been under fire about because we're comparing it to traditional standards. I think there's something to be questioned there. But really, you know, even if this whole statement were true, 4% of 20,000 people is still 800 people. And that's, that's a lot for any one class for most, for most institutions. So even at face value, I think this could be a positive statement. And then um, let's take a look at um, the whole pie here. So there's 4%, nine, that means 96% didn't pass the class. And is that a fair thing to say? So to give it a fresh perspective, we start with the pie of 100 per total percent of participants. These are the people who registered for the class anyway. I am pretty sure that we were OK to get started. And maybe some child has grabbed the bell. I don't know. Um, that's what my kid would do anyway. Um, so we start with 100% of all the people who registered for the class. And if we decompose that pie a little bit differently than just, say, 4%, what we found at Illinois is that 44% of the people never log into the course once. They sign up for it. There's no barrier to entry. In Coursera, you put in an email address, you click a button, and you're done. But similarly, there's no real pressure to follow through on that if it were an obligation to begin with because you do not have uh, tuition on the line. You're not moving halfway across the country or the world to take this class. There's no real... Uh, extrinsic in incentive to participate, and so 44% of them never even show up once. So that leaves the 56 that are left, and of those 56, about a third or 20% of the total registrants we found were active only one day. Essentially, they logged in, they poked their head around, and then they never came back. And 
in some ways that can be viewed as a negative statistic. I think it's also possible that's a success factor. That 20% were able to look at the course and very quickly determine that it didn't meet their needs. Maybe they could tell it was going to be way too much work or the topic wasn't relevant to them or what have you. So that takes those um, people out and we're left with the last 36%. Now if we insert that 4% wedge, we see that 4% in the context of only 32%, it's so about 11% of the students pass the class. And I'm not trying to say that 11% is a really great number. I'm just trying to say that it's all about how you look at the numbers and what you put in the denominator. So at Illinois, we put, if you're active for more than one day in the denominator, and we look at all of our metrics against that. So let's look at that statement again for, okay, fine, 11, whatever percent of students pass the class. Still is a kind of a, a negative sounding phrase, but I also want to kind of decompact the rest of that phrase as well. When we call them students, are we implying anything about what we expect them to do, how we expect them to behave when we call them students? Um, just for reference in Coursera, they have moved away from using the term student and toward the term learner instead. Maybe there's something there. And then passed, what does it even mean to pass a class? Essentially, passing still does come down to earning a certain number of points. And how do you earn points? By completing certain activities with a certain proficiency. So in other words, these learners are jumping through whatever hoops the instructor has put in front of them. But how well are those hoops aligned to the individual needs and goals of the students? Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then if we call it a class, is that what this is? I guess that's what the C in a MOOC is, Massively Open Online Course, but you know, for some participants, they don't view it that way. Uh, I'm going to show you some data about that a little bit later. So I think it's important to kind of take this phrase, the 4 or 11% of students pass the class, with a grain of salt. It has its place, but I think it's also uh, just the first step towards analyzing success in a MOOC. One thing I want to point out is this is some data that we gathered from our surveys about why students took the course. We asked the open-ended question and then analyzed, hand-coded, a thousand other responses. And one thing that I th find interesting is down towards the bottom, get a certificate or credential is only about 3%. If I were to ask the same question to the traditional students in the credit-bearing courses at my institution, I think that number would be 100%, right? They're not going to take the course unless they're getting credit for it. And they may check other boxes as well. But the point is, we have very different audiences when we look at the traditional higher ed courses versus the students who are taking these MOOCs. And I think we may want to design our courses accordingly. And we'll see that why most people are taking this is merely, if you want to call it that, to broaden or extend knowledge or general interest and appreciation of the topic. So there's a very different motivation, different rationale behind the vast majority of people who are taking these MOOCs. Um, but nevertheless, we naturally want to try to talk about MOOCs in meaningful ways. And so we do things like 4% of students pass the class. We have some baseline metrics. There's a number of studies, and the formatting on that got a little um, funny, I'm sorry. But you know, different people trying to categorize the learners in these courses. And there's just these different terminologies. I'm not really wanting to talk about them in particular, except to say that as a community, we're all still wrestling with this concept of how do we put our hand, how do we name what we're seeing? And we don't really know yet. My favorite is the grazers and strivers. I think that one's kind of interesting. Um, and so I'm not here to propose what the proper labeling is. Um, but my one observation about each of these labels is that they're very linear. And they kind of um, presume a progression towards what somebody thinks is the best kind of student, um, the most uh, achieved student in our courses, and I kind of question that a little bit. And so I'm just going to show you one, uh, and, and it, it is nice because it makes for pretty graphs, but um, I want to show a, a slightly different way of looking at it. Again, this is not necessarily the right answer. In fact, I'm only showing you one of the answers that we have for purposes of illustration. And that is to say, let's not look, try to use traditional metrics of success in higher ed as the baseline, but let's take a look at the data and see what the data might suggest is happening in the courses, and then try to name that. And so we also want to recognize that with the diversity of motivations, that graph, that horizontal bar graph I showed you before, these students are coming into courses with very different goals and very different definitions of success that they have for this, these courses. And so that's what we're trying to recognize in this. 
So all we're doing here is trying to take, in this case, we put on the y-axis the percentage of total points earned, how many points they got in the score in the course, versus the number or percentage of the videos that were watched. And then we do k-means clustering to group these into five bubbles. Now, there's intersection points all over this chart, but what we've done is we've filtered it down to five representative bubbles. And we see down in the lower left corner that large pie wedge that we saw on the, the earlier graphs where people are not really participating in the lectures, they're not really participating in the quizzes, we might call that low level achievement. And then kind of in the middle purple area uh, where we see 20, 30 percent of the total points scored, 30, 40 percent of the videos watched, you know, that's probably indicating that people are making some progress through the course and then they're abandoning ship. We see that happen a lot. A lot of previous uh, presentations today and yesterday pointed to that same effect. And then we get the three remaining bubbles that I think are the interesting ones. The top left corner um, is people who earned a lot of points in the course but they didn't watch any of the videos. So that's a little bit counterintuitive. That's a different form of success for them. For these students, perhaps they already know the material, so they're not gonna bother taking the quiz, the, take, watching the videos. They're instead gonna demonstrate their knowledge via taking the quizzes. Maybe they're looking for credentialing. Maybe they just wanna like, have that sense of accomplishment without investing the time in the lectures. But for them, my point is, they have success in the course without taking the course in the kind of the whole perspective that we might think of. First, watch your lectures, then do your quizzes. No, they're skipping that to get to their own form of success in these courses. Bottom right, the orange bubble, that's where we see that they watched a very large percentage of the videos, but they did not earn any of the points on the quizzes. And that's probably because they're doing what they want to do, which is watch all the videos. Kind of, They really probably want to have a YouTube channel in fact, I kind of wonder if maybe we should be making YouTube channels to satisfy that particular bubble rather than trying to force them through the hoops that we're trying to push them through. And then the top right corner is the kind of the traditional achievement category where they're watching all the videos and they're earning all the points and they're successful by our standards. It just happens to be that it's success by their standards as well. Um, what we see, by the way, um, is that the, those three bubbles of high achievement do have uh, very high satisfaction scores. The other two bubbles have some degree, but obviously not as much. And so, again, my only point is to say how we're trying to label these students in their success really drives a lot of uh, our interpretations of success of the MOOC as a whole. But I think if we just change the way we look at it, we might have different perspectives. Thanks. Okay. Um, hi, so I'm Hal Domey from the University of Maryland. Uh, this is going to be a sort of brief overview of a couple of things that we've done related to student engagement. Uh, it's joint work with a bunch of students and postdocs um, who, of course, did the real work, and then uh, also my former colleague, Lisa, uh, who's now at Santa Cruz. Um, so uh, a lot of this is going to be a bit of a repetition of what Jason said. So this is, uh, this is actually Coursera data. Um, from Coursera, so this is basically just looking at uh, completion rates. So the uh, the red box is sort of the you know two to four percent of uh, students who actually succeed. But the interesting thing is that even if you ask people in pre-course surveys, do you intend to complete the course, uh, still only about a quarter of those students do. Um, and so uh, the the rest of the blue bar, uh, the seventy-five percent, uh, we're going to call the savable students. Um, and, uh, and we're going to try to figure out, like, uh, what can we do uh, to keep them uh, in the course and, uh, and why did they drop? So I don't know why the coloring got funny, uh, but there's this great thing from George Koo uh, called the Disengagement Compact, uh, which you can't read because most of the words are missing, but I highlighted some of them. But it's basically that uh, uh, students don't want to work, and instructors don't want to work, and so we have this compact that says, you know, well, I won't make you work too hard if you don't make me grade too much. And so what we're trying to avoid is this situation uh, where, where students don't want to work. Okay, so, um, all right, I'm getting very nervous about the formatting at this point. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the things that we've looked at is uh, what people talk about in discussion forums. And I'll talk a little bit more about what courses we're actually using for, uh, for, for this later. Um, but here are some example quotes. So 
Uh, I think our values are shaped by past generations and our families as well, sometimes negatively. Um, any sort of off-the-shelf sentiment analysis will tell you that negatively is a negative sentiment word. Um, someone else says, what I love about this video is how much music influences social change. So many great songs can motivate change in people in society. So the bold green words are sort of the obvious positive words. Uh, then you get things like the video was terribly jumpy, I hated the experience, or this was a great course, learned a lot about genes and the human condition. Um, so the, the sort of observation is that there are two types of sentiment that people can express. Um, the first two uh, are course content related um, sentiment and the last two are course logistics related sentiment. And this is particularly important, I think, when we talk about humanities courses. So a lot of the data that we've been working with is humanities data. And, uh, and for instance, the first quote here is from a women's civil liberties course where a lot of the discussion is people relating their own personal experience related to things uh, about women's civil liberties. And often this will come with a lot of emotional baggage that gets uh, displayed as negative sentiment. But if we treat sort of the negative sentiment towards some topic the same as negative sentiment toward the course, then we're sort of missing out on a lot of the nuance of what students are talking about. Um, so I'm going to briefly say uh, how we try to model this. Um, all of the details will be missing, of course. Um, but basically, we're trying to capture things about student behavior. So this is post, view, and vote in forums, um, viewing of lectures, taking of assignments. Um, we're using structural information. So do two students post in the same thread? Uh, we use linguistic information. So what's the subjectivity in the posts? As well as what are the topics that that subjectivity is related to? So not just is this a positive or negative post, but is this a positive post about course logistics? Or is this a negative post about some particular course topic? Um, and then also some temporal features. Uh, so the way that we do this is we use this tool called probabilistic soft logic, which lets you write these nice little logic rules that say something like, um, if Sophia posts something, uh, so she has some post, and this post has positive sentiment, then I'm more likely to believe that Sophia will survive. And for survive, for now, we're just using the notion of uh, did they complete the final assignment or not. Um, and so these things, oops, these things are not uh, sort of hard logic rules, they're soft logic rules. Um, and the weights or sort of the strength of these rules is learned automatically from data. Um, so basically, it's a convenient way for us to write down things that we might expect to be true, and then the learning system can figure out which of these actually help model the data best. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, so these are the sorts of things that we have uh, related to the, the sentiment and the post topic. So in the first one, we say something like, well, if Luis posts uh, something, and this something is about logistics, and he's saying something negative, uh, then he's less likely to survive. Uh, the second one says, if Flo posts something, that something is on a general topic, uh, then she's not likely to survive. Um, so basically, if you're just talking about sort of nothing, rather than talking about an actual course-related topic, uh, this isn't going to help you. Um, the third one says that if Shauna posts something about the course and this gets upvoted, then she's more likely to survive. And then the last one is correlating behavior between two students. So um, if Shauna had this course-related post and she survived, and Sam had another post that looked like Shauna's post, then, Sha then Sam is more likely to survive. Um, so these are sort of the, the flavor of the sorts of things that we're able to write down. And basically what we see is as far as this um, the survival prediction task, uh, this helps sort of to varying degrees depending on the course. So we have the Women's Civil Liberties course, which I mentioned before. Uh, this is a disruptive technology course, and this is genes and the human condition, which is basically a non-technical um, genetics course. Um, and so what we see is that there's, you know, somewhat of a boost for adding uh, the sentiment features and then a larger boost for having the topic-specific sentiment features. And this seems to be uh, much stronger for these humanities-like courses than for technical courses. So we also did this for the Stanford Machine Learning course. There, the sentiment alone was fine because no one's talking about their experience as a child learning about decision trees and how decision trees had a positive or negative impact on them. 
Um, OK, so the other thing that we did was we looked at trying to model specific types of engagement. So this is actually super related to the bubbles that uh, Jason was showing before. So um, we're going to refer to students as actively engaged or passively engaged. So these are basically the upper left corner students and the lower right corner students in Jason's picture. So the actively engaged students are ones who post positive things. Uh, so Mario makes a post. This post is positive. So he, we're going to say that that makes him more likely to be actively engaged. Um, on the other hand, um, if there's some post that's positive and Keiko upvotes it, uh, then we're going to say that she's passively engaged. So she's sort of lurking. I mean, she's actually clicking a button, but she's not actually typing something. Um, and then we're going to have sort of this combination rule that says, basically, if you're in both of these categories, so if you're in Jason's top left bubble and bottom right bubble, you're more likely to be in his top right bubble. Um, so if Aditya is both positively and uh, is both actively and passively engaged, he's more likely to survive. Um, and so this is the same sort of result that we saw before. The effects here are actually quite strong. So the yellow bar here is if you just try to predict survival based on number of lecture views. Um, so this does very badly for the disruptive technology course. It does OK for the genes and human condition course. Um, and then the, the, the orange bar is basically what happens uh, when you just directly model the survival as a function of the input variables rather than trying to model the two different types of engagement. And so the difference between the orange bar and the blue bar is how much gain you get by trying to directly model this distinction between active and passive engagement. Um, and for instance, in the Women's Civil Liberties course, this makes just an enormous difference. Um, so I wanted to spend my last minute uh, just saying a word about the sorts of things that we're looking at now. So my background is not in education. <laughs> Uh, my background is in natural language processing, which is why I'm particularly interested in discussion forums. Um, and so one of the things that we've been looking at uh, over the past several months is uh, trying to use discussion forums as a way of fostering and increasing the amount of knowledge building discussion that you get, um, especially in these humanities courses, but also in technical courses. Uh, so there was, a, there was a great couple of papers by Vodong Chen at University of Minnesota um, where he hand-coded both uh, discussions made by K through 8th graders, as well as discussions on Coursera, um, into various things that I would call uh, dialogue states. Um, so when people say things, you can say, well, are they questioning? Are they theorizing? Are they obtaining evidence? Um, are they just sort of offering opinion? Um, and then by looking at the sequence of dialogue turns uh, that different students take in a discussion, you can try to predict whether this discussion is knowledge building or not. So um, Bodong's uh, uh, results basically said that effective discussions uh, have more theorizing. They tend to integrate use of information. So for instance, you theorize for a while, then you obtain some evidence, then you theorize some more. Um, Ineffective discussions have lots of opinion giving. Uh, this sounds like uh, faculty meetings to me. Um, and so what we're working on now is how to detect these things automatically rather than having to go in and hand code them one by one. Um, but sort of in the limit, it's not really enough to detect these. What we want to do is intervene and actually try to pop the knowledge building discussions up to the top uh, so that students really know what they can look at. They can engage in the material. Um, and hopefully have more of a, um, I don't want to say the word engage again, uh, more of a personalized experience in the course. All right, thanks. Okay, so um, I am the uh, third person for this panel talk. Um, and it's only fair that my two co-panelists all experienced some you know, technical difficulties not intended. So it's only fair that I also had some you know, technical difficulties. So that's you know, expect where I would be expecting that kind of thing. Um, so uh, my name is Al Wang. Uh, I'm from Columbia Teachers College. Um, I work with Professor Ryan Baker's um, educational data mining lab. Um, 
So following the, str uh, the string that Jason had talked about some really high level engagement and uh, motivation issues, and then um, how I also talked about um, his case and especially he touched upon the discussion forum analysis on, and sentiment analysis. And I thought about I should be the third one, uh, not because I might be the shortest you know, presenter for um, this session, but also um, I will focus on one specific case study, um, focusing on one specific MOOC. Um, so a quick outline, even for a five to seven minute talk, um, I'll give you some research context and also methods and analysis. And third part would be just an overview and reminding of what our major findings are that can be helpful for you guys. Um, so this one single MOOC uh, we worked on is called Big Data in Education. We collected all the keywords and hot words, you know, big data, education. So we're both practitioners and researchers in this field. Um, this course was offered only once up until now, uh, last year from October 28th to December 26th, and these are a few bullet points of what we covered in this course. And uh, similar to the majority of the early Coursera courses, uh, our course components are pretty common. We have videos, assignments, dis discussion forums, and study groups. Uh, this is a quick interface. Um, we have PowerPoint slides and a talking hat. Um, very enthusiastic you know, instructor, as you can tell. Um, and this is some quick facts about um, an early course survey we um, designed. I wanted to emphasize this is an early course survey, so it's not a pre-course survey. We specifically uh, distributed this survey after we released the first week materials so students can have at least some taste of what they're gonna be engaging with. And from this survey, um, we, we had responses from students uh, coming, sp speaking at least 106 different languages. Well, um, before I um, advance to you know, the, the forms, the data, I also wanted to ask myself and you know, all the audience members, what could be you know, some of the research questions we should ask ourselves, both as researchers and practitioners? Um, of course, our topic and panel is on motivation, and we want to know different aspects of motivation. How do they correlate with course on com completion? And after that, we can ask ourselves, what can we know about MOOC completers and non-completers? What are some of the differences or similarities? And later on, of course, we all wanted to enhance our you know, interface design to give our students a better learning experience. So a quick survey overview. Um, we have uh, amassed altogether over 48,000 registrants um, at, the, at the first week. And we only have 638 students completed the course. So the completion rate is not so promising. But I want to emphasize that um, what kind of a student population we're talking here, what is our research designed for, we might not want to you know, enhance all the MOOC learners' learning experience all at once. How about you know, the completers and non-completers, or even the survey respondents, who are maybe the more engaged students? Well, we want to know more about them. Um, so in this survey, it's actually a really short survey. Students only need to take about five minutes to seven minutes to complete it. And we included three um, types of variables to try to measure student motivation. And the, the first category, we selected 10 items which were used in some early research studies to, to, to ask students, why do you take a MOOC course specifically? And the second category, we selected uh, 
it pal uh, two powers motivation subskills to measure mastery goal orientation and academic efficacy. Um, if you want to learn more, you can uh, go online and just type in PALS and the University of Michigan. I'll give you the full scale of what their, uh, what their surveys are designed for. And we also include them one item. We just simply ask the students um, in the first week, you know, how confident do you think you will be f able to finish the course according to the pace set by the instructor? Um, and we found that because we, we want to know the differences between um, course completers and non-completers. And then we found there are statistics significant, significantly different uh, between um, completers and non-completers -complete, um, for the 10 items. Um, we call that MOOC-specific items. Um, and Okay, so I had the same issue. <laughs> that it's supposed to be one, two, three, of course. Um, and the self-reading skill is also another good indicator to say um, whether you will be a good uh, completer or not. And to uh, control for multiple comparisons, and we use the Q values to in place of um, P values. And this super text heavy graph just you know, trying to tell us that the PAL scales we selected uh, did not really show significance between uh, non-completers and completers. This is actually pretty consistent with our hypothesis that we think that um, both completers and non-completers, they're all voluntarily signed up for MOOC courses. So they should be both high uh, in terms of academic efficacy and being mastery goal oriented. Um, so, sorry. So in this graph, um, we, we also listed um, the items I said in the first category that we measure uh, MOOC-specific items. And the, the ones highlighted all showed statistic uh, significance between the completers and non-completers. And I'll explain uh, why they can be interesting to be grouped together. I'm going to skip this. This is the PALS items. Um, so the self read is confidence is actually a pretty good indicator. Um, so if you ask a student, where you, well, we give them the scale 1 to 10, let them to self read themselves uh, how confident you are to complete a course. And if you are confident in the beginning, and then you are more likely to finish the course. So uh, just a quick review of what I just touched upon. Um, So I, I said about the, remember the first category of items I, um, I mentioned? They're, they're the questions we ask, you know, um, whether you think a geograph geographically located in a remote area is um, an, an important thing for you to take the course, and whether you think a MOOC platform as a new platform is an interesting um, thing, be so that, that really motivated you to sign up for the course, that kind of thing. So um, all the items showed up significant, or all the items, students who showed that they're more interesting in the novelty of the MOOC platform rather than the content itself. And of course, you know, the, the two PAL scales were trying to measure um, mastery goal orientation and academic efficacy are not really great indicators if we want to know the differences between completers and non-completers. And the third one is the self-reported confidence um, is a pretty good indicator if you wanted to ask your students in early in the course when you still have you know, quite promisingly um, at least around like several hundred students will respond to you. Uh, you can get a quick idea of whether they would actually finish the course or not. And there's a fourth one. Um, we also did an interesting test on the two survey items of the two groups of not completers and non-completers, but uh, the English, speak uh, English native speakers and non-English native speakers. And we look at the differences on their self-reading score on you know, early in the course, whether they can complete or not, before they actually you know, start the second week of the course. And very interestingly, that the non-English native speakers self-rated higher 
um, in their completion confidence than native speakers. Uh, we're not exactly sure what are the reasons behind it, but we were thinking about, there are two possible reasons that, and number one is if you are an English, lear English language uh, learner, you might have you know, experienced more learning opportunities just because you want to learn English from, from the you know, past three years, so you might have amassed great learning skills by just learning English. Another reason is some of our students, we actually got to know them. They, they told us that one of the reasons they want to take our course is not just because they wanted to study stats, machine learning, programming, but they wanted to improve their English. It's a fantastic opportunity for them to, you know, to be able to even join the discussion forum to test whether their language can be understood by a student from New York. Um, some of the next uh, plan, plan studies we want to do is we want to connect our variables we got from the early course survey uh, with other metrics such as, you know, um, the log analytics, log data, which uh, we just got from Coursera. Um, and of course, the other components such as discussion forums, quiz completion rate, video usage, uh, uh, and also, of course, like um, engagement navigation patterns. Um, we're also trying to, well, some of, some of our colleagues in Columbia and our uni other universities approached us and they want to use the same survey in their courses. So we expect to re-implement and replicate the studies with them to try to see whether there's any disciplinary differences between our course and their courses. Um, and one of the very exciting course um, that I really want to recommend is an upcoming edX course. Um, it's called Data Analytics and Learning. Um, I'm going to show you a graph in the next page. Um, another thing I'm also really excited about, in the next stage, we want to conduct a little longitudinal study to try to measure um, the impact after taking a MOOC. We want to know whether students, you know, after taking our MOOC have went on to, say, submit a paper, uh, joined an academic conference, um, or whatever they did because of, you know, taking our course. Um, so we're looking forward to see some of the findings in there. And this is the course, uh, I did a screenshot of edX. Um, I would urge you to all, you know, sign up right now <laughs> um, for really great um, university professors from four institutions, and Professor Caroline Rose is sitting here. Um, it's going to be a great course in Ryan Baker on Dragon Guest Wing, and of, of course, the famous George Siemens. Um, another sort of a little um, soft motion, um, Professor Ryan Baker made sure that uh, I mentioned that he has already put up all the learning materials on his personal website, um, meaning that everything you can get from the Coursera interface, all the videos, um, all uh, you know the slides, the papers, uh, the learning materials. If you go to this website, you can access them without, you know, establishing any like locking password. You can just watch it and do it. Um, this is also you know a very simple. Um, I don't want to use the word design. It's just a web page, but it's also a course, and it's called Massive Online Open Textbook. <laughs> um, and if you want to follow us, um, we were potentially going to re-offer, also re-offer this course in a traditional MOOC setting, meaning in edX next year in January. Um, this is our lab's Twitter handle. And thank you very much. So I'm going to do the honor of uh, try to initiate the uh, discussions. So we three actually try really hard to get to know each other, because we didn't really know each other before this panel, and then we actually went on to have a Skype call and everything, and say, like, we need to get to know each other's studies, and then have to work on this thing together. So, and one of the things popping up is we wanted you guys to have at least something to take away, not just say, like, we went to your presentations, and then nothing really stayed in my mind or really helpful. So we asked ourselves to list some, you know, key points and takeaways from our presentations. I'm not going to read it. Uh, you can just, you know, look at them. Um, 
kind of like as a quick reminder of what you just have heard us to talk over like 30 minutes. And after that, we're going to do this uh, discussion. And then, Jason, you want to? So if you could just you know, take a couple of minutes and turn to someone near you. And if you're kind of isolated, then you know, go find someone to become near to you. And just talk about what we talked about, namely, but also in your own context. You know, where, where are you doing similar research? Or where have you found maybe um, conclusions that differed from what we have? And so just take a couple of minutes to share amongst yourselves. And then we'll open it back up to the larger group. Thanks. About one more minute. About one more minute. About one more minute. About one more minute. Thank you. Well, I hope that, I know that that was probably a short amount of time for most of you to get to know one another a little bit. It's so exciting. We can't even stop talking. Oh, I feel bad. We'll have more time, I promise, right, after we uh, leave this session before going to the town hall, continue these conversations. What I'd like to do is actually these great conversations that are happening amongst two or three people, I'd like each of your groups just to throw out one or two things that you learned about from your discussions uh, as a group or something that you struck you about our conversations. But we want to just kind of take the next 10 minutes. We're going to reserve the last five minutes for a different activity. Take the next 10 minutes just to share any insights that you have. And there's the two roaming mics. If you can raise their hand, these guys are good about getting it to you.
sorry, what's your name again? Renee. Renee. Hi, uh, I'm Chen from uh, MIT, and um, in our group um, with Chris and Renee here, uh, we uh, what what what. Um, what we found is that we're placing too much of an emphasis, emphasis or, or too much of a bias on completers. People who completed the course gets a certificate. I've been in a lot of MOOCs, and I've always been that 96%, unfortunately. Um, yeah, uh, I've been in Ryan Baker's course, and I didn't finish. I spent about a week, so it's a very bad data point. But I mean, in many of the courses I audited, I completed uh, some of the assignments, I learned something, and uh, I was saying that uh, um, if, if you, we are a business and we're only focusing on 4% of our customers, we have a really bad business model. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so, so I'm just starting to think that um, we should really fo uh, focused on, on understanding these people who come in, learns part of, a, does some part of our assessment, learns some part of the videos, uh, how do they value this perception? And Renee here just told me they published a paper on, uh, uh, on pretty much the similar issue and, and says that uh, people who didn't complete the course like the course almost as much as people who completed that, right? I suppose one thing to, to, to qualify is, uh, I mean, one of the points you make is placing a, a value judgment, uh, you know, you had these greater than equal signs, right? And we, when we wrote the, the deconstructing disengagement paper where we really wanted to get rid of the notion of completers and non-completers and look at how people actually behave and try and characterize that, uh, we were struggling with whether we should place some value judgment on what is better than, than something else. Uh, and we ended up just doing it a little bit because we felt that if learning is the ultimate goal that these these uh, devices, these MOOCs serve, right? And at this conference, I think we we uh, we we hope so. Then uh, then doing assessment, retrieving knowledge, as we learned again and again at this conference, should be uh, of of a, should be encouraged in some sense, right? So that's why it, it, it's tricky. I just have a really quick comment adding on that. Um, I completely agree with both of you that completion rates is not the sole indicator or not even the primary indicator for measuring success in MOOC learning environment. But then again, when we were, you know, uh, brainstorming about what kind of research we want to do, there are two reasons we wanted to choose course completion. Uh, number one is it is, we have to admit, the most popular, most talked about metrics in universities, institutions, um, all kinds of areas. And that's one of the easily accessible metrics that we should not um, overlook. And number two is, I personally thought of, you know, the way to, you know, separate the completers with non-completers. So it's not to say we want to judge you because you did not complete a course. But more interestingly, we want to know about this interesting population that's being filtered through our course. We want to know how, um, you know, like, these kind of students, they have their own lives and jobs. Um, and of course, our courses is not the, the best course ever, giving you all kinds of support. And we all, as faculty members, we all make mistakes. And this, there's something wrong, that's something wrong. But despite all of these, you know, students, there are 4%, 1%, or whatever percent of them actually persisted and completed the course. And you, if you think about that, it's, it's really something amazing. And we want to know, I want to know also, you know, like what's giving them the strong motivation to complete the course? And what's really distinctive for, you know, that, that just people in general can learn from them, can get from them. So that's one of the motivation for us to, you know, separate the completers and non-completers. More thoughts? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we were talking about um, is, is um, the mastery goal uh, orientation scale, and I, I was we were interested in that because um, um, I've actually run items from that scale as well. So uh, I guess I wanted to share that we had a few significant results of that, not focusing on retention. Actually, um, we're on the third iteration of running a composite scale that includes items of you know mastery approach 
orientation, but also um, some other scales. But the mastery items were, and, and they're tricky, you know, tricky to take these subscales and very tricky to deploy them, right, and find the, the strongly loaded items that like people will interpret the same way. Um, so we, we were on the third iteration of this. We ran it in a MOOC. We also ran it in a couple blended classrooms at UCSD and at UCLA. Um, and in the more, tr more, slightly more like, you know, real life classroom, blended classrooms, it was predictive of completing the course. But in the MOOC, it was predictive. We were focusing more on other things like of um, engagement, right? So students with higher mastery orientation, they were more excited about the class. They liked it more. They were more talking about sharing it with other people, stuff like that. So um, I guess that's one of the things we were chatting about was just why it would be works in some ways and maybe not work in other ways. But Certainly research in this area is challenging. Any other thoughts? Uh, I actually, yeah, uh, Hal, do, you ha do I have my, your name right? Or? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I wanted to share a few thoughts with you, you know, being in a you know, similar work and trying to learn you know, sort of similar things to what you're trying to learn. Um, you know, the truth is what we're seeing from the intentions data that we're starting to get from different platforms is that the truth is more than 50% of students who enroll in MOOCs uh, self-report that they intend to complete the course at the beginning. Uh, so you know, I wanted to basically share two, two thoughts quickly. The first is uh, when you mentioned the idea of amenable versus non-amenable student groups, uh, it's, you know, the, the, uh, literature and self-regulated learning us usually distinguishes between internal and external factors. So that's like, you know, some people just left because the content is irrelevant, so it's just irrelevant. Or some people, you know, don't have time. So there are ways to identify this in pre-course surveys. And so I think this could help kind of, you know, sort of cut out a, a, a you know, a slice of students that really are non amenable for intervention and just focus on those, you know, with internal factors. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, uh, it's okay. I, I forgot. Sorry, technical Sorry. difficulties of the brain. I get it too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so yeah. So the other thing is, you know, with this high fraction of people who intend to complete the course at the beginning but don't. Uh, I feel that MOOCs are, you know, apart from the content that we're actually delivering. Uh, they serve an excellent platform for mentoring students' work habits. So if you know that something is useful for you on the long run, and uh, I believe that because of your you know, work habits, your habits of self-motivating yourself, your volitional control of yourself, how much you, know, you try to say, okay, this is useful, I have to overcome my, my desire to go on Facebook and Twitter and actually save some time to go and do the MOOC. I think this in itself, if we look at it as something we can use MOOCs as a vehicle for changing this trait in students, it's well worth the research and the money that goes into it. Yeah, so that actually reminded me of something that I heard, I think, in the previous or previous, previous section where someone was talking about, uh, or maybe it was during the plenary session this morning, I don't remember, but there, there was this uh, discussion about the importance of, uh, of having a community and feeling like you belong to a community. And for me, this is one of the really exciting things about the discussion forums is because that's one of the places where this happens. And so trying to find a way to foster this as a way of building up people's self sort of internal motivation, I think is really exciting. I, I, I totally agree. One last comment before our, our last activity here. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I would uh, have kind of a meta question. So I'm from a European uh, MOOC platform, and we are we also surveyed like 400,000 students. And um, the procedure seems always to be to um, to have like um, segments of students, then uh, performance indicators, and then um, most of the researchers um, find correlations. And um, perhaps one or two uh, researchers already found um, interventions to manipulate the segments and make it better. But what's the the whole goal of it? Um, do we in the end, if we find out something, do we really? want to intervene on everybody and, uh, and um, make the performance indicators better like this? Um, at least, yeah, I'm not sure. So what's your... Well, I, I think anyway that the answer to that question is it depends. Um, kind of to my, early, my first point about how when the way we answer some of those questions that keep me up at night um, is very dependent upon the goals of the institution in delivering a MOOC in general. There's no standard reason why we're all in this room. Right? We're all here for different reasons. Our institutions are doing MOOCs for different reasons. And I think that those different reasons can and should drive the research we're doing and can and should drive the way in which we design the courses. Uh, I, I don't know if either of you think that there's an easy answer to his question, but I think it's actually a hard one. Oh, I, I don't think there's any 
way to answer a question with an easy answer, but um, I can give you an example of that. Um, so from our link st study, one of the findings that if you're a student, you're more interested in just the novelty of the MOOC platform, um, you're less likely to be completers. So what does that mean for you as you know, instructor or designers? Well, um, if you have a goal to say, I want to you know, improve, our, improve our completion rates, or you want to say, I want to have a more specific learning groups of students that they know what our course is going to offer, and they, they have a sort of correct anticipation of their weekly commitment, even before they start the course. If we, you want a cohort of students like that, you might be able to just, you know, emphasize, you know, before you, you open the course saying that our course is, um, you know, re re requires six, six hours a month of work, and you have to have specific pre prerequisites. If you emphasize that much more, uh, in a distinctive way, maybe it's a, it's a better way to filter through um, so you can get students that are more engaged. All right, so now I want to keep our microphone runners on their feet because what I'd like everyone to do is, is just you know raise your hand and in 30 seconds tell us one thing that you're going to do tomorrow or on Monday as a result of this session or one question that you're going to bring back to your research team. I'm going to take notes and I'll share them on that PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we don't have the slides up anymore, but we'll get it to you one way or another and you can, you can uh, see the notes of what other people are going to do um, when they get back. So what's, what's one thing you're going to do or one question you're going to ask your team when you get back? Or was this completely valueless? That's acceptable. <laughs> wasn't completely valueless. So um, I think what we're going to do is really try and clarify for ourselves why we're doing the MOOCs, because that's what we need to do in order to be able to define success metrics. And it's been very clear to us for a while that completion is not answering our questions. Um, so it's going to be really focusing on, on clarifying more um, meaningful metrics. Sure, great. Other next steps? I'm going to add one uh, question to our motivation survey. So not to ask uh, people um, on the intention to complete the course, but on the self-confidence to complete the course. Good. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think for, in terms of like the next step for like our research, like for our research team, it's more to like trying to trying to build up like a MOOC, uh, like a MOOC uh, collaborative community, and to and also to bring up all the all the researchers together, especially the ones who are trying to to tackle with all the Coursera data and uh, and other kind of like very ambiguous mm -hmm. stuff. So that's that, that's a challenge. <laughs> I got something to say. Uh, I think, so I'll, I'll also, I'm here for the conference, I'm just volunteering. But I think uh, as someone who's working on launching a MOOC, I'm going to take back and make sure we're addressing the types of students that maybe just want to access the content as an educator or as someone who wants to review the material and making sure that completion rates aren't the only thing that I'm looking at. Yeah. I, yay. <laughs> Uh, so I'll add something. So uh, there was actually a Twitter discussion during uh, some of the presentations. And one of the things that came up that I'd like to do is maybe ask students not why are you taking this MOOC, but what does success mean to you uh, in the context of this MOOC so that we can evaluate people according to sort of their own rubrics. More on the technical side, but I, I read your papers. I, I, you know, I, I initially seemed to love the PSL framework. Uh, so one thing. I'm going to look into is, you know, how can we use it and how does it compare to work we have done? We can help if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a last comment on, so for me, um, my next step, I would want to, to know uh, what we can do about non-completers, because if we were to build, you know, a, a formula or a model to assess any given MOOC, 
that, of course, we're going to look at non-completers. So for example, um, a student you know, comes in just you know, third week and look at one video and complete one task and very happy and he or she just laughed. How do we you know, infer that maybe from the log data, from discussion forums? How do we factor that kind of uh, good feedback into our assessment model or even not really so good feedback? How do we con combine all of these um, engagement patterns to assess um, a MOOC, whether a MOOC is doing a good job or not. I hope that um, if someone mentions something that you, they're, they're going to do as the next step and you're interested in the same thing, you go find them right now because we're done. Thank you. <laughs>